quite like it before. Jane Mansfield, the blonde sex symbol, hit Trilly with the impact of a bombshell. Rumours swirled like leaves in the wind. They said she wouldn't come. And when she did, the controversy raged. The clergy told the people not to take her show at the Mount Brandon Hotel. A letter from Dean Lane, read in the churches to Sunday morning crowds, condemned the visit in the strongest possible terms. One cinema manager with a real sense of timing booked one of Jane's movies, It Happened in Athens, for the night of her visit. But, oddly, it went without comment. On a different level, not everyone in Tralee thought Jane's personal appearance was worth 10 shillings a head anyway. Personally, I think she's been a has-been. I find it hard to believe that uh, the Kerry people are so foolish as to pay 10 shillings to go in and see, see a woman. Oh, I think she's fabulous. Such a big star should get a, a civic welcome coming to a town like this. Sex, I suppose, is a healthy thing, you know. But um, the fact is that we are supposed to be a Catholic country and it doesn't seem right, to my mind, bringing an exponent of sex to a Catholic town. Really, I don't mind her coming at all. Well, I think uh, they should have brought some more talented than Jen Mansfield to town, uh, like uh, Patricia Cahill or something like that. I've never seen her on the screen. I've never seen her in reality. She's just a figure. I like people who can sing or dance or do something other than what she stands for, you know? She's a film actress. I don't see anything wrong with her. I mean, just because she wears a mini skirt. I mean, look around the town, you see plenty of people wearing mini skirts. Oh, it's just she's welcome. I don't mind her appearing at all. I'll be going down in my have a look at her. Well, I think it's much ado about nothing. Uh, I think that people locally are behaving in a very provincial way about it. If they don't like her, they needn't go. And uh, it would be much better to ignore her if they don't like her than start up such a great fuss. And in any case, I don't think she's all that of a danger. And there are quite a lot of distasteful things in Ireland that are just as distasteful as James Mansfield. And uh, we hear very little about them. They, they get a social acceptance. Uh, it's all a little bit prudish, I think. But the figures were impressive, Jane's and her fee. Six songs in a 35-minute spot for £1,000, almost £30 a minute, if the show went on. But the quiet rumblings of midweek reached flashpoint on Sunday morning and 45 minutes before she was due in Tralee, the hotel bowed to the opposition. A court statement read, owing to the controversy caused by the visit, the management have decided to cancel her appearance.
Ms. Mansfield, we'd like to know what your reaction is to the cancellation of your performance tonight. Well, there has been no... Uh, there seems to be a problem. Actually, I think Billy can explain it better, that the musicians are lost somewhere near Dublin. That's the only cancellation we're hoping they'll get here. Well, how do you um, relate that to the statement already issued by the hotel that the it was cancelled owing to the controversy caused by the visit? The hotel? What? Oh, I the doubt that. To the press. I doubt that. Here's your general manager. He'll issue a statement right now. I, I have the statement issued by the press in my hand at the moment. By the it hotel? Reads, yeah. Who issued it? Owing to the controversy caused by the visit of Miss Jane Mansfield, the management of the Mount Brandon Hotel have decided to cancel her appearance. Well, Mr. Uh, Billy Clifford here is... Uh, uh, has another statement to make. I'm sure if you ask him, he'll tell it. Yeah. You want to tell your statement, well, uh, manager? That is not entirely correct. Actually, not we've correct at all, is no. It? You see, unfortunately, last week I received from Mr. Sam Brody, who looks after Miss Mansfield, while she's in Ireland, and I think at the British Isles. Uh, I received copies of music and so forth, and these I sent to a backing group in Dublin. Uh, unfortunately, I left here today, as you all aware go to Shannon to collect Miss Mansfield at approximately 10 o'clock. When I got back to the hotel at 7, I've heard that they have broken down in, on the way out of Dublin and they're not to appear here tonight and unfortunately all uh, uh, the music which I had sent them and so forth, which they have rehearsed, which she needs for her backing and I mean uh, Miss Mansfield needs uh, a top class backing group, which she deserves as a world top ar artist. Unfortunately, I can't find them. I can't contact them. They are not to be located. Well, if I uh, this may lead to another <clears throat> statement from me tomorrow or the day afterwards, uh, when I finally uh, put my hands on them. If I may move on to the controversy that does exist, in church today you were called a goddess of lust, and the suggestion has been made that your performance could be a possible corrupting influence. Now, how do you feel about this? Well, obviously there is. Uh... There's a misunderstanding somewhere, because as you have just heard a review of my act, my act is satirical, it's, uh, it's very clean, it's fun, people like it, they enjoy it. No one cancelled my act tonight. The music was lost. It had nothing to do with me. If the music gets here, I'll go on. I'm ready. What about a statement from the hotel that the uh, act had been cancelled? Well, you had an written statement. Here is your general, general manager. manager. Why don't you ask the general manager? Oh, no, he denies it, and he denies it categorically. <clears throat> well, were you surprised at the reaction, uh, the controversy that arose because of your visit? You've been to Ireland before. Uh, I, I let me say this. I did hear of a bit of controversy. 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 Yeah, trying to say it as, as you do. You do say it like that, I believe. But uh, I, I did read in the paper, it was so funny, when the situation turned, turned up with the, the empresario who allegedly brought me over and actually found himself without funds. Don, referring to Don, Don Arden. Don yes, and I continued my act. And it is booked right now for an additional nine weeks at a rate of between 1,000 to 2,000 pounds a week um, increase. But uh, the Bailey organization, which was the first set of producers for my act, said Jane Mansfield is a top flight uh, movie goddess. She's not Judy Garland or a female Fred Astaire. She is a sex symbol. Now, I did read where one of your labor members said that Jane Mansfield State, she's a sex symbol. We don't want that here. I never said I was a sex symbol. I can't judge another woman. But I suppose that's where it began. But that has nothing to do with the fact that the, uh, the, the management, uh, something went wrong with the music. It's, it, uh, I, I know nothing about this. But have you ever had to face this kind of a reaction before from the people of a town? The reaction has been people fantastically beautiful. You, you oh, in a, the, the controversial the people reaction. People of the town. You, you asked a question, reaction to people. The people of the town, if you saw, uh, we had a stop, unfortunately, for a flat tire in uh, one of your towns prior to reaching Philly, <laughs> and uh, there were three or 400 people that crowded around the car that Jane Mansfield was in. Now, this is a town of 500 people. Apparently, the reaction, they love Jane Mansfield. So this is no reaction of the people. I found that there was quite a lot, from talking to people in the streets of Tralee, I found a lot of women opposed your visit here. 
Really? Do you find that this is something you've got to live with as a sex symbol? Uh, I thought they were quite nice to me, actually. Of course, they're most they, of the women were around the car. They were right around the car, asking for autographs, giving me flowers, throwing me kisses, saying you're not bonny lass. Uh, um, a wee lass. On, on your career, you seem to be concentrating more now on cabaret than films. Does this mean your career has moved into a new phase? No, I just finished two very important films. Two very important films. One, Guide to a Married Man with Terry Thomas, the 20th Century Fox in Hollywood, which will be released within two or three months. It's their biggest film this year, and Single Room Finished. I'm also going to begin a film for Delphine, Bernard Delphine, Mask of Innocence, within the next two or three months. If I may ask a question that may be slightly ridiculous, um, as movies become more sophisticated, is the old-fashioned sex symbol going out of date? Why don't you answer that? <laughs> <laughs> well, getting back to the churchman's comments today, what do you accept this charge by the Dean of Caddy that you are the goddess of lust? <laughs> I feel I'm a very good... There's your answer. <laughs> I feel that there's a time and place for everything. I have five beautiful children that I have brought up myself. I have been the sole support of all five since each one was born. I feel I'm a good Catholic and... I hope some people think I'm a good entertainer. The flashpoint in Castle Island, a narrow country road, a couple of yards wide, bounded by farmland and a building site. Itinerants are entitled by law to be here. There's no prohibition order against caravans. They have been using this road for years and the present settlement is here for five months. Fifteen families at most on 35 yards of road. But one day recently, the itinerants were asked to split up and leave. A deputation called on them at the camp, and this, according to them, is what happened. Two or six men came up to stop them. What, they were about ten minutes talking to them, what, and they came up to the caravan's den. And they asked us, what are we leaving? And we asked them, why? So I, uh, they said that we should leave. That the man above us was denied, and he was fit to go to that side so we, we said we could do nothing about it, that we were ready to get camping sites. We didn't know how soon or how quick the camping sites would be got, but we were just lingering on. And then we told them that the children was going to school and we couldn't leave. They said they had in, this man, he started beating inside the caravan with his hand. And he said if we hadn't gone again that night at one o'clock, that they put bullets in out through the caravans. Guns, bullets threats of violence, a new attitude in a town noted for goodwill to itinerants, and a distinct embarrassment to the Castle Island Itinerant Resettlement Committee working for their rehabilitation. The committee has pledged to housing, in time, in the parish, five itinerant families. Already two others have been housed. They are prepared to assume their responsibilities in a new movement to aid carry itinerants. So too, they say, are the people of Castle Island. Ironically, the talk of guns emerged from the committee's initial meeting. Retired Garda Michael Behan admits to having made a joke that's boomeranged. I did say that it had reached the stage where the local people had decided, or were about to decide, to get them rid of them out of it by some other means, some means, if they didn't go themselves. So they received us very favourably and they said they would leave that day. We told them that it was in their own interest that uh, they go that the farmers would pre were prepared to let them camp outside their houses if they scattered, and in ones or twos, but not more than two caravans together. So but there is a very strong feeling against the tinkers in, this, in, in Castle Island. Uh, very much so, but that is the result of an invasion of tinkers from Galway and Mayo before Christmas. There is no animosity towards the local, what we term as Kerry tinkers, of McCarty's, O'Brien's, Coffee's, Quilligan's. None whatsoever. Well, at the meeting at which you were present when they were debating the itinerant problem here in Castle Island, I think you did mention guns. Uh, there was a mention of gun when, the when the, it was mooted, uh, moved at the meeting that a selection of seven or eight men be selected to go to interview the tinkers or coax them to leave the place. 
I said as a joke, they better bring guns, and if they happened them, Mr. Hogan, the local firearms dealer, who had already spoken on the matter, would give them guns. And that was uh, treated as a joke at the meeting. A joke, perhaps, but it's had a side effect. Since then, one farmer sought a shotgun for what he terms protection. He was denied a licence by the guardie. This attitude is not typical of Castle Island, one of the best towns in Munster, according to the itinerants. But they claim they're as much a part of the community as some people who might be objecting. How serious is the situation? Local feeling mounted before Christmas when 140 West of Ireland itinerants descended on Castle Island. Some of them were prosecuted for causing disturbances in the town. None of the itinerants now camped in Castle Island were involved and they have agreed in the interest of the town to split up their convoy and move to various parts. Despite rumours, Mr Willie Lyons, chairman of the resettlement committee, denies the situation is explosive. It might develop into a serious situation if we didn't get the cooperation of the itinerants, but with the delegation that went to them yesterday morning, they have cooperated and they have distributed themselves in pairs sites within half mile of the town where the children can still go to school. That's our primary object in getting the children educated. See? Well, Number one anyway. How do you relate this much ado about nothing to threats of guns and bullets and that? Well we had a meeting see last Tuesday night, a very good meeting, a lively meeting I suppose if we'll call it such. And some men stood up, I won't say on the spot at the moment, I'd say more or less in a a loose kind of a way that there was plenty of guns in the locality. Well, I don't really mean, I don't really think he meant what he said, you know. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this same gentleman, he was on the deputation that went to the itinerants for their cooperation, and he said perhaps if they didn't cooperate, that maybe that there might be trouble and maybe maybe there would be shots fired. Well, no, that, that situation doesn't obtain here at all at all. No Three checking his watch. Many others in Croke Park doing the same, and the game is on. And first to break away are Kerry. Mick O'Connell getting the ball up the field to Mick O'Dwyer. It's hard, honest to goodness football, but not yet productive of the really thrilling, exciting stuff that I'm sure will be ours before the hour is over. Bosco McDermott checking the line ball that goes up the field towards Mick O'Connell, and it's gone out over the line, a line ball for Goldberg. Oh, the line's going to change his mind, I thought, there. Uh, he signalled first, at least it looked to me as if he did for Galway, it's for Kerry, it goes into the centre, Sean Mead for Galway in possession now, tackled by three Kerry men, and gets his kick in out to the far side of the field, Cyril Dunn running up for Galway, 60 yards from his own goal, he's chased when he gets his kick in, up along the far side of the field, very near the sideline, Mr. Turner and Mick Morris going for a place between them, Sean Cleary to, <laughs> oh no, oh no Paul, no, you cannot put your two arms around a man and love him in such an endearing way as Paul O'Donoghue did there with Paddy McDonough. Just held on to him and there's a free in for Galway. Kerry forwards, or Kerry backs obviously worried that these Galway forwards might get moving with one of their passing machines and now it is Cyril Dunn to take this free. He slipped a little bit as he took it, it comes across the field. Mount uh, Shemus Layton has it now on the 21 yard line. He takes it over his head, a high one, and it's over the bar, a point for Galway, Shemus Layton. Galway, five points, Kerry two. Twenty minutes gone in the first half. Five to two in favour of Galway. This teacher, one of the many teachers on the Galway team. All these lads, amateurs. Kicking this ball in now, Pat Donald right into the goal mouth. It's held in there by uh, Donny O'Sullivan. Donny O'Sullivan out by Seamus Layton. Gets it, Seamus Layton, 40 yards out. Trying to cut his way through now. He takes his shot and he sends it. It hit the post, yes, but it's over the bar. A point for Galway, it hit the upright. But it went over the bar and Galway lead by six points to three after almost 22 minutes of play. And yet the game has not really got going. Even though there's very little between the sides and maybe that's the reason. From the kick out, Ender Cullen gets it out. Sean Mead gets it for Galway. 60 yards of his own goal through the centre. Goes right up there to Christy Tyrrell. Christy Tyrrell about 40 yards out. Gets the ball in his hand. Fits it up to John Keenan. 50 yards out. Keenan takes the shot that's high. And it's gone over the bar. And then it's for Galway. 
kind of passing movement, the kind of passing movement that can electrify a crowd and can really bring a game to life. John Keenan, the scorer, the time, almost 24 minutes of the first half on the score. Galway, seven points, carry three. Pat Donald to take it. And as he takes it, Dennis O'Sullivan comes racing across in front of him, but he does take the kick. It goes across out to Sir Dunn. Sir Dunn, about 30 yards out, is foul there and heavily fouled by one of the carry men and the referee putting his name down in the book. The referee standing for no nonsense whatsoever. The referee speaking to some of these defenders and writing their name as. Slightly to their right, Sertle Dunn is being attended to by Frank Stockwell. And now, whether it's the sun that's out again or what, but the game is beginning to wake up. Martin Newell from 40 yards out from their own goal. Take this goal by line ball. Into the centre where Nick O'Connell gets it. Nick tips the ball back to Dennis O'Sullivan. Dennis O'Sullivan going up the far side of the field with the ball. He's still going. He's been chased by Pat Donald. He gets it in there to Jojo Barrett. Barrett cutting up the solo in there to Barry O'Connell. Barry misjudges it. Ball Tierney comes out, handles out. The ball breaks loose and John Donald is touched it on the ground. And there is a free in for Kerry. Bernie O'Callaghan to take this one and a point here would mean there was only a point between them. Number 13 and he's back. Going to be unlucky for Galway. It's over the bar. A point. A point for Kerry by Bernie O'Callaghan. Seven minutes gone in the second half. Galway, eight points. Kerry, seven. He not cooling the wine after it. Just a point between them now. And Pat Donald goes for it together. Pat Donald breaks it down. A dirty corner of Kerry comes dipping in. And the Kerry man sends it away up the field. Where it is brought down by Vincent Lucy. Goes back out now to Pat Donald. Pat Donald 60 yards out from his own goal. Tackled rather heavily there just as he was kicking the ball. But he got his kick in. Gets it up to John Keenan. John Keenan way up to Christy Turner. Christy Turner to Seamus Layton. Layton on the 21. On the 14. And it's a point. scored by Seamus Layton just that one over one of the open Galway movements there Johnny Cullity not wasting any time now on the goal placing the ball for the kick out remember there are no stoppages no delays it's 30 minutes each half so it behoves Kelly at the moment to get as much play into that game as possible in an effort to pull down this lead and Mick O'Connell getting the ball for the kick out out now to Jerry O'Shea Jerry O'Shea being chased by John Donnellan Jerry O'Shea still going on John Donnellan is a hold by the Crowders and oh, Jerry and John no. Jerry O'Shea brought down by John Donlan by the trousers there but uh, apparently uh, they didn't uh, like it too well and the referee has put a man I think he's put them off looks that way. Anyway, we follow the play for the moment as Bernie O'Callaghan takes his free and sends it over the bar for a point. A point for Kerry scored by Bernie O'Callaghan and John Donlan and Derry O'Shea have been put off the field for that incident uh, in which there was almost a torn trousers and a fleeting dash of lost temper. Linesman's ball. The linesman couldn't determine who sent it out, so he sent it uh, to it himself from the throw in. The ball comes Johnny O'Sullivan up the field to Tony O'Shea, Tony O'Shea for Kerry cutting in now, he's 50 yards out, he's 40, he's 30, he sends it across, and that comes Paul Tierney, and Tierney gets it, he's tackled and fouled, and there is a free, a foul there, the referee talking to one of the Kerry men, for a foul on Paul Tierney in the dying moments of the game, and the referee putting him off, referee putting off Tony O'Shea putting off Tony O'Shea for that foul on Noel Tierney and so with time ticking away the referee obviously not standing for nonsense from anybody takes blows the whistle with time ticking away now Kenny with 13 men coming into the attack and Dennis O'Sullivan held there and Dennis <laughs> Held. The whistle blew for a free for him, but uh, he seemed to be rather annoyed with being held there. And there is a free to Kerry. The time ticking away now. 
Galway virtually champions unless the equaliser can come now and it could the boss come into the parallelogram right it goes to goal now but in the parallel is there Callan gets it and roots it out into the far side of the field where Pat Donald is in under Pat gets it and goal village perched 1,000 feet on the side of a mountain overlooking the Blasket Islands it's a quaint little village commanding some of the most magnificent scenery we have and as far away from the cares of the city as you can get. Kirari is claimed to be the most westerly inhabited spot in the country. Next stop out there, New York. All in all, this is the ideal spot for you if you want to break into the tourist industry or if you want one of those holiday homes in remote parts, which are quite the fashion now. But if you feel you can't afford it, by making a special offer in Kareri this month. Would you take the whole village, all 40 houses, one pub, one church, one garden station, and one schoolhouse, free? Absolutely, anybody can have it for nothing. It's all a gift <laughs> from faraway productions to the people of the, of the Dingle Peninsula because we've been so happy here and they've been so nice to us. The offer comes from Mr. Anthony Havelock Allen. Just over six months ago, his company built a road up the side of this mountain, brought in earth movers, cement mixers, and a work crew of over a hundred men. They hauled in thousands of tons of stone, and in just a few months had built Kirri, a model village from the past, from its cobbled main street to its antique pub. And now they're giving it away. The reason? Kirri is in fact the set for director David Lean's latest film, Ryan's Daughter, being shot on the Dingle Peninsula. But it's a set with a difference. This one was built to last. Because of the gales which sweep in from the Atlantic, the village had to be built not with the usual fiberglass and wood, but with rock. Otherwise, it would just have blown away. Some of the houses have heavy wooden backs, but the company would build stone walls in their place if anybody wanted to take over the village. Kirri is a reconstruction of the 1916 period in which the film's action takes place complete with decaying cottages, dusty shop, or IC station, it's as if time froze here. Actress Mari Keane, who's playing in the film, holds that the fact that Kirri is held in the past could make it particularly valuable. You see, all our Irish crafts uh, are traditional and they originally originated in little houses like this. Like, take there are tweeds that we sell and have now become world famous, really. They all began in weavers and little houses, you know, all those ballads we have, the weavers turned in the lot. And then uh, you have our glass and you have uh, pottery, wood turning, knitting, crochet, lace, all those things. Supposing you had visitors coming, they could all go into the cottages, not alone buy them as they do in various shops and things, but see them actually be made all together. I always find it difficult to go from potteries to weaving sheds and, you know, all over the weather, tweeds are made, but supposing you had them all here together in these very identical little houses, I think it would be a great attraction. So it could be a permanent exhibition? Of course it could, and, and a very lucrative one on our exports, and, and of course a mail order service <laughs> for abroad, you know. Who do you think might get it off the ground? Oh, well, I don't know. I only can use ideas. Somebody else has to do the thinking about it to go about it, but it is absolutely wonderful and so authentic. I was up there in that window making a shot one day and I looked over at the shop and I thought to myself while I was waiting for the cameras to roll, I thought, that's very nice there, I must go over afterwards now and see how much that is. And then I realised, of course, it's only Prop. the shop, yes. All of the backs are, are not there, you know. What are your feelings? Will the opportunity be taken? I'm sure it will. It can't. It's too nice to lose. It's absolutely... I'd love to play in it. Were you in the shop? I mean, yeah. I'd love to play shop there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it should go. Even the road, look at the actual stones and the cobbles, the way they have been carefully placed in this old pump and the lock. Wouldn't it be terrible to take it down? Even as it is now, cold and deserted, about 10,000 people have gone to the trouble of getting special film company passes and travelling the 10 miles from Dingle to see the village. That seems a fair indication that if anybody did take it over, money might be made from it. The film company would ideally like Board Falcher or some other body of that standing to take over the village so as to ensure that it would be properly preserved. But if that fails, says Mr. Havelock Allen, producer of the film, it's open to all to try their hands. Why such generosity? <laughs> well, the plain fact of the matter is, 
if we don't give it away, we have to knock it down brick by brick and just leave it as it was at bare mountainside. And this seems an awful waste since everybody who's been to see it says what a splendid reproduction it is. And it's built absolutely solidly. You know, it's built of stone and local stone and breeze block and uh, the proper slates and tiles on the roof, the chimneys all work. I mean, it's not like a normal film set, which as you know, is a sort of flimsy affair and is meant to last two or three weeks. This will last for 25 years or 30 years if it isn't disturbed. And therefore it's a big job to knock it down and it seems sad to have created a sort of solid village and then just to destroy it. Can literally anybody have it? Anybody can have it, yeah. I mean, the only problem is that they will have to, presumably, deal with the people on whose land it is built. And this, it's not, I think, not even very good grazing land. It's sheep grazing land, and it doesn't cover a very large area. Obviously, the people who own the land will have to be part of whatever undertaking takes on the village and turns it into uh, whatever it turns it into, a tourist center, uh, uh, you know, um, some kind of a landmark. You're not specifying. Anything can become... No, anything. And what is more, we've, we've agreed that we will make good any of the buildings, and some of the buildings have, uh, have flimsy backs to them. All these we will replace with stone and brick, and we'll, every building will be made absolutely solid. We will repaint all the fronts with the kind of paint that is more durable than some of the paint we've used, so that you have a village which will stand for 30, 40 years. On the face of it, this seems a, a more than generous offer. Is there any catch? No, I don't think there's any catch at all. It's just a question of whether it can be turned into anything that will earn its keep. Uh, and I don't know whether it can or not. But it's a curious thing. This film is a very big film indeed. It's what they call a roadshow film. It will be shown for long runs in theatres all over the world. And the film, Ryan's Daughter, if it follows the pattern of David Lean's previous films, is going to be something of a landmark film. Now, the village is one of the biggest characters in the film, and therefore, as a, a center of interest for all filmgoers who may be among the tourists, and there are, I believe, many millions come every year to this part of the world, it's arguable that a large percentage of them will be interesting, interested to see the village. Uh, David Dean once made a film in Venice, and the tourist authorities in Venice told him this was very soon after the war, when travel was very much restricted. And they said, well, we don't know how much it had to do with your film, but in the year following the release of your film, we can only tell you that the tourist trade to Venice went up 30%. Now, of course, Venice has a great deal to offer, but at the same time, it, a lot of people who perhaps had uh, never thought of going to Venice, a lot of people who had uh, never thought it was possible for them to be able to afford to go to Venice, suddenly decided on the strength of that film that they had to see Venice. Now, a certain number of people may feel that they have to see the village where Ran had his pub and where Ran's daughter was born and brought up. One would have thought that you'd have been chased by a large number of would-be pub owners. Has this in fact happened? Well, not, village pu owners not, no, not pub owners, but we have had quite a number of nibbles of people who've said they would be like, I mean, uh, they would be interested in the idea of turning it into a tourist. I mean, we would obviously have to have the approval of Board Fulcher, we would want some cooperation, or whoever took it over would, also of, I think, the local Kerry Council. I mean, it must have a point other than just coming to see it. But while we've been here, we've had, I should think, well over 2,000 applications to be allowed to come and see the village during the course of this summer. And this is before the film has come out and before the publicity has really made any impact. But have you had a large reaction to, um, to your offer to take over the entire village? Well, we've had uh, a lot of people have expressed interest in it. We've got two different parties who have said that they would like to, but they've both gone back to Dublin and they, in order to discuss with Board Fulcher what might be possible. And uh, one or two people have, uh, have contacted the Kerry County Council with a view to seeing what it entails. What it really needs, however, is a sort of entrepreneur who will go into the facts of the case. Obviously, it'll cost a little money to maintain. There is the question of paying some compensation to the owners of the land, which would otherwise be sheep grazing. Uh, therefore, there's a certain annual outgoing. Somebody uh, probably 
two or three hundred a year or something like that. I have no idea, but that sort of figure. Somebody's got to compute whether they think they can make it a going proposition. How long are you leaving the offer open for? Well, we can't leave it open and uh, for too long because we and the people who built this village, who would be the people who have to destroy it if it has to be destroyed, uh, won't be here much after the end of the year. So I would think if we've got no firm offer by the end of October, we would then have to decide, well, it's too late. We can't risk uh, leaving it any longer and have to bring back a construction or rather a destruction crew, you know, to take it down. So we would start uh, beginning to demolish it at the end of October. not very glamorous, is it? But then, hard work never is. And that's what the Festival of Kerry, any festival for that matter, is. Hard work by the people who make it tick. They're faceless, really. But they can make it success or ruin it. And failure would be costly. has £20,000 to mount the festival of Kerry, Tree's annual Mardi Gras to choose a rose. Crazy days of revelry, singing, dancing, drinking, for the merrymakers who explode a sedate town's population from the normal 11,000 to 100,000 a day. These days of wine and roses meant a turnover for Tralee businessmen of around £600,000. And then the festival moved on to Dingle and other towns to spread more money around. But it wasn't fun and games for everyone. Or did you notice, sir? This festival is each year sponsored by a brewery. Pubs and bars do roaring business on extended time. Doors closed to control crowds. 5,000 at a time. A lot of money. A lot of work, too. Glasses, for instance, washed 40,000 times a day in one bar. Did it make you stop and think? meals. In one, more than 1,200 a day. 3,000 steaks in a week, 2,000 chicken and duck, and a variety of other food. 
hard work in the kitchens and on dining room staffs. But it didn't weary those who came to eat. They paid for service and expected it good. Truly, jammed to full capacity can house 5,000 a night in seven hotels and a multitude of guest houses. But that's not so many when half a million come to town in one week. Anyway, that was the tourist girl's headache. It meant accommodating some 30 miles away. In the last week between Friday and yesterday, Wednesday, we dealt with between 10,000 and 11,000 inquiries. And we booked about 2,000 bed nights for the people coming into the office. Outside of accommodation, the requests we get are dealing with all the festival activities, like free fishing and racing, and where the people can go and see the roses, which is the most popular request, I think. It is tiring, but um, we enjoy it, you know. Um, we're not working all day long. We have special hours, you know, and there's four of us, there's four of us here in the office, and um, we're open until 12 at night. It means a lot of hard work, but we enjoy it all. And even if the work is hard, I enjoy it very much. Oddly, despite the revelry, festival visitors have few brushes with the law. But the Garda Force of 24 was this year more than trebled by reinforcements from all over the county and from Cork and Limerick. They were all on street or traffic control. There was more stealing from parked cars this year, but crime was overall insignificant. Hard to understand, perhaps. People were too busy making merry. Or too busy walking. It is a reflection on the, the nationalism or the patriotism of the people of Killarney as a whole. Yes, it certainly is, uh, and I'm sure that uh, there will be disappointment in many areas as a result of this uh, decision. Well, do you think that people can say now that they weren't adequately briefed about uh, the plebiscite, what it was all about? Certainly not. It was uh, hanging fire since last May when the present council readopted in 21 resolution and it has been adequately, adequately discussed in various places in the town. Well, is this the absolute end of the matter now? As far as the council is concerned, yes. The position has been resolved for the first time in 44 years. If a group or a street or a roadway, uh, if the ratepayers wish to have their name of the street or roadway changed, they would have then to get four-sevenths of them to ask the council to hold a plebiscite in that street or roadway. But uh, you would be prepared to do that in the light of recent events? Oh yes, that would be. That's what we're there for. We have to uh, bow to the wishes of the majority of the raters. O'Shea is a, a resident of Hen Street, a rather strange sounding name in an Irish town. Mr O'Shea, were you happy with this name? No, I'm not satisfied. As I believe, Hen Street is called after Hen, a British Army officer. And I prefer to see the name of a Plunkett Street, uh, like any Irishman would be on Hen Street. Well, how many people in Hen Street are, were eligible to vote? There was 31 voters. Uh, 13 voted against and 13 for. Which left out, there was five that didn't vote. Mm -hmm. And perhaps with that five, we'd have uh, Plunkett Street up instead of Hen Street next Easter. People of Killarney refused to change. We let them answer for themselves. Tried with the name that's in our street, and we think the name of our street, Main Street, is the best business street in any town, and it would cost us a lot of money to change the name of the street. We'd have to change billheads and cabs. We'd have to change the plates in the house, 
And I also think it would cost the Urban Council a lot of money. And at the moment, the rates in Killarney are higher than any other county in Ireland. ...against the change, because I believe these old names are part of Killarney's history and should be left alone. I am all for honouring our patriots, but I believe this should be done by naming new housing estates and new parks after them. Huzzy is a, a shopkeeper in High Street and an urban councillor who fought in the fight for freedom. I asked him how would the men of his generation react to the decision of the people of Killarney. Direct insult to the memory of the men of 1916, and I didn't expect that the people would think so quickly, uh, forget so quickly the great sacrifices that all men made in 1916, and I think the result kind of staggered me. Well, would you say that the people of Killarney put uh, a consideration of pockets before patriotism? Well, I'd say to a certain extent, yes, that a certain portion of them wouldn't be in favour of changing the names anyway, but I thought a lot of, lot of the people were of the opinion that they'd have to change their billets and their documents, and some people thought that they'd have to even have to change their licences and their bars. Uh, one man told me he'd have to change, he didn't have to change his deeds. You see, the people weren't properly instructed about it, and they all thought that this thing would make a terrible change in their whole lives. Well, do you think if they got another chance, they would change their, their minds? Yes, I'd say a certain, a certain amount of wood. Tremendous shortage of women in Kerry, and there is need for a matchmaker. No. Would you agree with this? No. There's no use in, there's no use in matchmaking nowadays, because I'll tell you why. First of all, the Irish girls don't want to stay, you understand, on the farm. They want to either hit for Piccadilly Circus or for Broadway. And to tell you the honest personal truth, I don't blame them. You understand? Mm. Life today isn't what it used to be. You understand with the standard of living and, uh, well, work. There's no work for them. More so in the rural areas. They might have some chance in the cities and that's why that they're leaving the rural areas and going to the city. And then they'll meet a boy from Donegal, you understand, or from some part, and they'll get acquainted and settle down without no matchmaker. Yeah, but, I mean, this is play... Uh, paints a very grim kind of a picture of life as it will be in places like Dunquid. Ultimately, from what you say, there will be nobody living here because nobody will want to get Would married. Would you believe here. it? It's gone. The population of the rural areas has gone, gone to deterioration completely. There's no doubt about it. I, I, don't, I don't see any way or system that they can bring back the population to the rural areas of Ireland because you can't live on air, you know. And, of course, you see, we know very well in the rural areas and more soon than Quinn, we know very well, we see, that no big factory can be, you know, built here. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And for that reason, they have to immigrate. But what are the prospects of a, a local boy and girl getting married here in their own area? Oh, the they're, they're, well, they're doing it. A few more doing that. With, with, uh, it's a case of meeting the girlfriend or the boyfriend at the dance hall nowadays. You understand? But is there no And the father and mother have nothing to say, even in regards to the marriage. The days of the matchmaker are completely gone. The, the day of the matchmaker is gone. There's no doubt about it. But do you think this is a good or a bad thing? Ah, it's, well, listen here to me. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. There's nothing like being, like being acquainted and knowing each other. And you'll know the faults and the good of both sides. True, but by what you said a moment ago, Kruger, the ma marriages you were talking about were successful. The matched They marriages. were, and they were very lucky. But, of course, you see, the world has changed in general, and so has the individual. The individuals of my day, when I was a kid, very neighbourly, that is gone. Is it's, it a case, it's a case of methane nowadays, not Sinn Féin. Right, are you? Yeah. And we're all to Dublin in the green, in the green, there you are. Stand up straight now and look your height, me dirty piss. There you are. Hey, Cos, are you interested? Mm -hmm. Now, remember you're buying a John Collier suit of clothes there, look. There's a decent suit of clothes. Terraline. There you are. There's a good blue shirt's coat. Have a look at that. Now, is that big enough? Open it up and have a look at it. Oh, that's big, Well, no. There's no fleas in the shirt. You don't have to look for them. I should have known they would be fighting me. There you are. Well, now, will you give me 22 and 6 for that nice decent coat, sir? And one more. What would you say for the coat? Half of it. Excuse me, sir. 
I'm selling you the course. This is installing it all. Yeah, hold it up. Chop, chop. Fifteen bob. I tell you what you do, look. Here, no nonsense. I tell you what you do. Give me another half crown, seventeen and six, and tis a deal. Right? Are you right? At seventeen and six, it won't break any. I'll half a dollar. I'll chase you. Right. Do you want a nigger, sir? Anything else today? Would you buy a nice cut or half a sleeve, in it, sir? You want a flan in that walking stick, sir? I got flan that walking sticks in the car. Don't cheat. <laughs> now listen here to me. I have a lovely coat that should fit you. Here's your decent coat. This is belongs to the new shop in Cox, sir. I try it on. A for pound. You. A what, sir? A pound. Oh, he's like Shylock with the pound of flesh. Did you ever hear tell of him? Hamlet, I am thy father's gimblet. Yes. <laughs> I know it's all Shakespeare. Yes, he was a nice man. He had two left legs. That's right. Charles Bredden was sure. What about that, you? Well, now, there you are, sir. Yes, it is good for Stand back here. How do I look in that coat? Is that a smashing coat? Yes. Will you take that coat for five pounds? Here, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. And the hell of poverty. Will you give me four and a half for that, sir? Two pounds, sir. Here, four pounds, sir, if you want to go. Four pounds now, no fooling. But it's a bad day, sir. It is a bad day, sir. And we don't want to be fooling in the rain, sir. Three. Three, this gentleman. Divide it, divide it. I tell you I do it. If you put 15 bob on top of the three quid, this is court. And that's as sure as my grandmother's gone up in the bus. There you are. What? Three quid up there, and it'll be his. Do you know what a court cost? Have handled the court in your hand, for God's sake. And look, take out your other hand now, look. Please. <laughs> you have two hands, have you? You have. I know a lot of fellas in Cockney have only one. Yes. Now, what do you think that court is worth in your honest opinion? Three quid. Three quid? <laughs> that court costs about 17 pounds. Is it kidding you, what? No, I don't Huh? Do you know what it is now? I swear to God, you must be used to buying stolen property down here. Because I wouldn't give you that Make coat. Make me a final offer. Final offer. I tell you what I do. It's a man word. I said 315. It shows a mine three and a half. She's gone again. No, God. Three pounds. Three quids. Three pounds. Three pounds. I'm sorry, sir. I'd like to give you the coat. But if you speak decent, I'm not going to be mean about it. I say you. Are you all right for one of these? Here. Come here, I want you. Here. Excuse me. Excuse me. Come to another discovery. There's been a new Danish Viking invasion of Ireland. And you can see the Viking encampment spread out down there on a Kerry Bay below me. But this time, there are no dragon ships, there are no bloodthirsty pirates. This is a very sober, business-like invasion of trout farmers, of all things. Trout farmers and mink farmers. And I'm going down the hill now to talk to the Danish managing director of Rainbow Limited, this trout farm, Mr. Hans Schmidt, to ask him why they've come here and what exactly they're doing. How long have you been here in Kerry, Mr. Schmidt? I've been in Ireland four years by now. How much of this time did it take you to get into production? Oh, we did a one-year planning and one year talking and two years working. Oh, that's a fair average. Now that you have started down here, how many men have you got employed? Oh, we are around 50 by now. And of these, how many are Danes? Four. Plus yourself? Yes, plus myself. So the other 45, they're all Irish? Yeah, they are all trainees. Well, naturally, I suppose they have to be trainees at first. This is strange work for them. How are they taking to it? Oh, some of them very well, and some of them just have to be changed until we find uh, people suitable for the kind of work we're doing. Well, what sort of men do you need? Is it fishermen or...? No, uh, in our experience, uh, the younger the better. Uh, they are more used to regular work, you know, coming in time in the morning and, and taking an interest in it. Well, the older men, do they not take so kindly to this kind of work? Ah, uh, it's our experience that the younger the better. How do the Danes and the Irish manage to make um, each other understand themselves? Oh, that's very simple. Normally, the Danes, when they come over here, have very little English, and uh, it seems to uh, mean nothing. But your own English is pretty good. Did you learn it here, or did no, you I, speak English before you oh, came? Oh, I did. Oh, I, sp I spoke English before I came. Where did you learn it? In India, as a matter of fact. What are you doing out there? The same kind of work? Yes, I build the coal stores over there. Well, um, now that you are in production, I've got a pretty fair idea of generally of what you're doing, but I'd like to know more details about it. Can you tell me from the very beginning how 
you raise trout. Oh yeah, it's of course a long procedure. You start really with the eggs and lay them up to the various stages. The eggs come from Denmark by air, packed in shallow boxes with ice to keep them damp and prevent them from hatching too soon. When they arrive, they're washed in a mild solution of acid to make sure they don't bring disease into the farm, and then they're laid in long, shallow troughs. The water comes to them through pipes from the stream outside at natural temperatures, and in three to four weeks they're hatched. For the next few days, they feed themselves from the egg sac, which stays attached to them. But once that disappears, they are permanently hungry, and there are six million of them. As they grow bigger, they're moved from one tray to another. At the ends of the trays, there are fine meshed screens to prevent the fry from escaping through the outlet pipe. Although the water is at river temperature, the fry are protected to a certain extent by starting life in enclosed sheds. After a few weeks, they're transferred to less protected ponds outside, under a roof but without walls. And now they need constant feeding from sunup to sundown. In these circular ponds, they grow to fingerling size during about three months. In the rivers, about one fry in a hundred survives. The rest are eaten by bigger fish or die of starvation. Here, protected from enemies and disease, at least one in three survives. From six million eggs, the farm will produce two million mature fish. These fingerlings are still a long way from mature, of course, but they're ready for transfer by tanker lorry to the main farm five miles away. The two farms draw their water supplies from different rivers, so that there's no possibility of any disease in the hatchery reaching the main farm. If it did, it could mean disaster. The two million fish here are worth perhaps 165,000 pounds wholesale. The water for these ponds all comes from the one stream, flowing through sluice gates from one pond to another and one terrace to another, so that one diseased fish in an upper pond could infect every fish on the farm. Therefore, it's not just a matter of letting the fish loose and watching them grow. They need constant attention. And the man who sees they get it is Mr. Hansen, the farm supervisor. One of his minor but constant worries is seagulls poaching his fish. Do you have a lot of trouble with seagulls and seabirds here after the trout? We had before we get up the way, but uh, there's no trouble now. You've and got these um, o overhead threads to keep them away? Yeah. And you have to shoot them ever? Yeah. We we shoot them when some some of them try to go under the way, and we have to shoot them. I was looking at your house just now, and you've got a searchlight on the roof. Is is that to look out for gulls and things here? That's for that's so I can see if the water is high or low in the ponds and the channels during the night. Yeah. Well, what would make the water particularly low then? If the screens get blocked, leaf or grass or any dirt comes in and oh, blocks this them. this is the screens up at the top of the yeah. river there. This would be in autumn or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then you'd have to go out and clear them. Yeah. Does all the water from these ponds come from that one river? It does, yeah. And how does it, uh, how does it get fed down? In a sequence of um, through the screens into one pond and yeah. then into another? Yes. If these fish were let grow as big as they wanted to grow and you didn't um, take them out for sale, how big would a trout grow? Some of them can go up to eight, nine, maybe ten pounds. This is pretty well the same size as a, a, a fair salmon. It is, yeah. And would these be the mother fish? They will be the mother fish, yeah. Have you got any mother fish here that you take eggs from? We have a uh, few only. We have about uh, 200. And have you started taking eggs from them yet for the, this we, hatchery? We took a few eggs. The great attraction for visiting children is, of course, the farm livestock. And indeed, the farmhouse holiday can be said to be tailor-made for them. City children, who have previously only played with toy farm animals, now have the excitement of feeding and looking after the live animals themselves. The boys love rounding up the cows for evening milking and helping to organise the feeding of the calves, while the girls generally look after the poultry and help in collecting the eggs. Well, Willie Dillon, apart altogether from guests, this is probably one of the busiest farms I've ever seen. What exactly goes on around? Oh, dairying and tillage. Oh, 
beaten, wheaten, Guinness barley growing. You seem to do a bit of everything, and yes. I even see trophies around for some of your yes, Aberdeen Yes, uh, Angus cattle, yes, and yeah. fat stock sales are shows, also a share of those trophies have clicked them. Well, in the midst of all this, is it possible that children are a big nuisance to you? No, indeed, no, indeed, I don't see any trouble at all whatsoever. But, but they spend a lot of time with you? Yes, they do, they do. Uh, oh. Kids from around the place, even in fact, for any tourists ever come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, is there any element of danger in it for the children? Oh, sure, I wouldn't think so, should there be much more danger in the city? Well, how are you able to, to fit in the, the guest-keeping business with your ordinary farming? Does it disrupt you? No, not a little bit. Not at all. Not at all. It's, everything seems to flow easily. Um, what about vegetables, do you care <coughs> especially for the house? Yes, we grow them all those ourselves. We grow how, them. how much of the range of the needs of the house are you able to cover? All but uh, just we buy the meat and uh, get the butter to cream it. That's about all. Well, overall, now, are you pleased that your wife has developed this? Oh, yes. Oh, side yes, line? yes. It's... it's it means I, I can't explain to you what, how good it is. Mm. Yeah, it's a, we're very pleased with it and it's just a great interest for us. And, uh, we feel very happy with all the tourists that come and go. They all seem happy with us. There's a social element to oh, it. Oh, yes, so much. And breaks up the whole, whole life and farm. Does it make a big In a busy farm such as Willie Dillon's about Furt, there are a host of farming operations going on during the holiday season. It can, in fact, be said that most activities of the farming calendar take place during this time, and during the fine weather, these activities are very much enjoyed by the guests. One of the most favoured occupations is that of haymaking. While the grown-ups lend a hand in helping to save the hay, the children play hide-and-seek among the cocks and generally enjoy themselves. One great asset to a farm running a farmhouse holiday is a placid pony. In fact, it might be described as a must, as far as children are concerned. Many children prefer to stay about the farm riding the pony, rather than accompany their parents on outings to the beach or surrounding countryside. The pony is loved by all, and many a tear falls at time of parting. For the city family, the country farmhouse offers a cheap, attractive vacation right on its doorstep. It helps both parents and children to get a real insight into the complexities and activities of Irish farming. In addition, it gives these farming families a chance to see new faces and hear new ideas. In the long run, it should help to bridge the gap that has been widening between urban and rural dweller over the past few years. <laughs> 